course is going to be broken up into two main parts. Two main parts. Uh, the first part will be biographical historical. In other words, I will talk about the life of John Wesley. Actually, we'll begin with his parents. Talk about his parents, the life of John Wesley, his early life growing up. And we're going to follow that biography, that journey, uh, until the beginning of the Methodist revival. The Methodist revival uh, in England when John Wesley starts field preaching, what he calls field preaching. And that will, that'll take us up to 1739, okay? Then we will stop. We will stop there. We don't have the time to go through Wesley's entire biography. He lived to be a very old man. Uh, he died in his 88th year in 1791. We're not going to go all the way up to 1791 in terms of his biography. So at that point, we're going to begin the second part of the course. And the second part of the course is theological. The first part is biographical, historical. The second part is theological. And it will basically follow what we are calling the, I can put this up on the screen here, uh, well, the blackboard. It will basically follow what we call the order <coughs> of salvation. There's actually a very brief Latin phrase for this, ordo salutis. Okay. We will follow at that point the order of salvation. In other words, we will begin with the goodness of creation, talk about the fall, the fall into sin, then talk about God's initiative in terms of grace, uh, beginning the process of salvation, and then we'll talk about every step along the way until we get to glory, until we get to um, being in the presence of God forever. Um, so that's the basic overview of the course. Two parts. First part, biographical, historical. Second part, theological. And the theological will be very orderly. It will follow the order of salvation and every step along the way, okay? Now, <coughs> having said that, I'm actually going to begin with another little piece of the course that has to be put in place first, has to be put in place first so that you will get the most out of the course because there is the possibility, if I don't put this piece in place now, right now, you will misunderstand. You'll misunderstand Wesley's biography, you'll misunderstand his spiritual journey, and then you'll misunderstand even when I start to talk about the Ordo Salutis, okay? So, what am I, what am I talking about? I'm talking about John Wesley's definition of sin. You need to understand what Wesley means by sin, okay? Uh, and so, uh, we'll start out with a basic definition here. It sounds, when you hear it, you're gonna say, well, this is very simple, but actually it's a little more complicated than you might imagine. Um, what is sin? According to John Wesley, nothing is sin, strictly speaking, but a voluntary, voluntary transgression 
of a known law of God, of a known law of God. And by a known law of God, Wesley means the moral law. What is the moral law? We'd have to ask, answer that question. Well, the moral law is in the Old Testament. What's the moral law in the Old Testament? Ten Commandments. What's the moral law in the New Testament? Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount. So those would be good expressions of the moral law. So we're not talking about the ceremonial law here. We're not talking about all the 618 laws in the Old Testament. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the Holy Law of Love. We're talking about the Ten Commandments. We're talking about the Sermon on the Mount. We're talking about the law that Paul says in Romans is holy, just, and good. That's the law we're talking about, okay? So, Wesley is defining sin in terms of that, and he says, nothing is sin, strictly speaking, but a willful, willful violation of a known law of God, okay? What's the, what does that word willful mean? Okay, that's actually very important in the definition of sin. It has to be willful. So let's say, for example, uh, I, I bought a bottle of Evian this morning. Okay, I went to the store over here. Now, suppose the person who sold me the Evian shortchanged me. Okay, but it, it just was a mistake. You know, he was busy, he made change, and he didn't give me the right amount, okay? Uh, has that person committed sin? Has he committed sin? No. It was a mistake. It was not willful. He did not intend to do me harm. He did not intend to cheat me. Now, let's say, for example, the same man, he wants to take, his girlfriend to a concert and you know he likes to make a little money off each customer and so he shortchanged me okay is that sin yes that's sin because it's a willful violation of a known law of God okay now let me illustrate this in another way think of the book of Leviticus you've read Leviticus in Leviticus Sacrifices were offered for unwitting sins, whether willful or not. The sacrifices were made, okay? They were unwitting sins, okay? Hold on to that notion. That's not Wesley's understanding of sin. Because if you take the Levitical understanding of sin, any violation of a known law of God, whether willful or not, is sin, if you take that Levitical understanding, you cannot make sense of what Paul is saying in Romans 6, uh, in Romans 8, and what the author of the first letter of John is, is writing in the first letter of John. You can't make sense of it. Okay? What is, what is John saying in the first letter of John? No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, do not be deceived. He who commits sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God commits sin. For God's nature abides in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Okay? What is, what is 1 John saying there? How is 1 John understanding sin? 1 John is understanding sin as a willful violation of a known law of God. Because in what I just quoted you from the first letter of John... If we took the Levitical understanding of sin, no one could be so free. No one could be so free. Because the Levitical understanding of sin is calling for a perfection of performance. 
perfection or performance, and that is an impossibility. That is an impossibility for us. But we can be free, we can be free from willful violations of a known law of God, okay? Um, okay, and so Paul talks about this same liberty in Romans 6, Romans chapter 6, also Romans chapter 8. Um, and this is very important. So you have to understand Wesley's conception of sin, or else when I talk about his biography and Wesley is saying we need to be free from the power of sin, now you're going to understand what that means. A willful violation of a known law of God. Okay. Let me, since we're on the topic and we're making introductory comments, let me fill out sin a little more clearly so you can understand. First of all, a very general comment. What is sin? It's alienation from God. It's separation from God. That's what sin is. It's a relation. It's relational. Sin is relational. It means we are not in a proper relation to God. God is a stranger to us. We are alienated from God. Why? Because we are walking and living in darkness. And God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. So sin, in a general sense, is alienation, separation from God. It is a perverted relation, not a proper relation. We are not in a right relation with God. It's a perverted relation. Okay? Okay. And once we understand that general understanding of sin, then sin comes in two major categories, two major forms. Okay? There are sins, plural, so we talk about sins, plural, okay? And we call that actual sins, actual, actual sins. They're the kinds of sins we commit. So we, and it can be inward sins, Someone entertains thoughts of lust, sexual lust. They yield to them. They are dominated by that impurity, those impure thoughts. That is sins, plural. That is inward. It may have no outward expression whatsoever, but one has committed sin because one has entertained and been dominated by uh, sinful lust. Okay? Or... Sins, plural, actual sins, can be outward. We lie to our brothers. We lie to our sisters. We cheat. We steal. We curse. We take the divine name in vain. We do all those things. Those are external. So actual sins are both inward and outward. Okay, inward and outward, the kinds of sins we commit. When Wesley uh, set up the class meetings, and then later when he set up the bands, a question that you would be asked every week, you show up to band meeting every week, you'd be asked this question, what known sins have you committed this week? And you'd have to tell the group, well, I did this, I did that, whatever. You'd have to tell. That's what we're talking about here. Actual sins, the kind of sins we commit. Okay. Now, we're not done with sin because that's only one kind of sin. Actual sins is one kind of sin. There is another kind of sin. And, and I think at times some Christian traditions are not sufficiently aware of this and it is a great problem. A great problem. And I see it in the churches everywhere, globally, everywhere. 
and we will get this right. We will get this right in this course. What's the other kind of sin? Inbred sin. What Wesley calls inbred sin, inbred sin, and notice inbred sin, this is singular, not plural. Inbred sin, what's another name for that? The carnal nature. It's a corrupt nature. A corrupt nature. Original sin, the carnal nature, inbred sin. It's sin singular. It is the corruption of nature that still remains even in a child of God. So a child of God can be free and it's a great liberty, be free from the guilt and power of actual sins. In other words, they stop. They stop committing sins. They're not under that slavish power. But the carnal nature still remains, that impurity within, a heart bent towards departing from the living God, that inward corruption, and so Wesley talks about sin remaining, in other words, the inbred sin, the inward corruption remaining, but it doesn't reign. It doesn't reign. It doesn't exercise dominion and power. So for example, let's take an example of this so you can see it. Uh, we'll take a man. A man uh, may see a very attractive woman and may feel a temptation towards lust. Jesus talked about this, may feel a temptation towards lust. He feels that impurity within. But if he doesn't yield to it, if he doesn't surrender to it, he has not committed sin. He feels that, that impurity within, that desire, that inbred sin, that, that lust, or it could be, to change the example, a propensity to pride to think of oneself more highly than one ought to think. That one has that propensity, bentness in that direction. That too is impurity. It's pride, it's sin. It remains in one's heart, but it does not reign, okay? So Wesley, in his writings, he makes these distinctions. Uh, the guilt is one thing, Wesley writes, the power, yet another, that believers are delivered from the guilt and power of sin, we allow, that they are delivered from the being of it, we deny. In other words, the carnal nature remains, that impurity remains, even in a child of God, even one whose conscience is clean, from the guilt of sin, and whose life is being lived out in holiness by not being under the power and dominion of sin, okay? So, it's very important that we get Wesley's understanding of sin on the table right now, so that when I start to talk about his biography, and I talk about his struggles, his struggles with sin, because he will struggle, okay? Then you understand, you understand the nature, the nature of his struggles and where he wants to go. He wants to be where Paul is. There is therefore, Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus our Lord. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free. Free. From the law of sin and death. Okay? See, Wesley wants to realize that kind of freedom, that kind of liberty in his life. And in order to understand this properly, properly you need to see Wesley's definition of sin. Okay, okay. So, <clears throat> with that in place, with that in place, uh, we can now begin to talk about John Wesley's biography. 
I love biographies. Um, I'll probably write another biography of someone <laughs> uh, down the road. I love um, the human story to see how people encounter difficulties and then how they overcome them, uh, to see how people relate to other people in all different ways and fashions, to see how a personality is revealed through action, that through our actions we come to understand person, uh, a revelation of who we are through our thoughts, our words, our actions, our relations to others. So biography, in a sense, is story. It's story, Geschichte, as the Germans would say, l'histoire, as the French would say. Uh, and the gospel, the good news, is also story. It's also a story. And so the issue of our own personal stories, our life journeys, our narratives are very important in terms of what we mean by salvation. Because salvation is a story. It is the grand story. It is the greatest story that has ever been told or that could ever be told. There is no greater story than the gospel. No greater story than the Logos is made flesh, that God comes. And not only that God comes, but that God descends to the level of Golgotha. Because why? Because God loves. God loves whom? God loves just the elect? No, no, no. No, that's bad theology. That's bad theology. And we're going to name that in this course. That's bad theology. God loves. Whom does God love? Everyone. Everyone. And God loves even the people you don't like. God loves them. Yes. God loves the people you don't like. And God loves them thoroughly. And that's at the heart of the gospel that Wesley came to embrace. The universal love of God. Paul talks about this in Galatians 3.28. Neither male nor female, neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. God's love is universal. See, uh, lots of times people out there, they don't like that. They don't like that God loves everyone. They want to, oh, no, 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 that can't be true. Uh, God doesn't like my friend, my enemies. God doesn't like those, those very bad people. God doesn't love them. Oh, yes, God does love them. And we need to understand that, how God loves all people and the universality of the gospel, okay, and how that, how that plays out. So we begin, of course, with story, small story. It's only John Wesley. But a small story caught up in a grand story. And see, that's the kind of movement that can happen in everyone's life. We have all little stories. We're all little stories. But our stories, in terms of meaning, can be caught up in the grand story. And it, what is the grand story? The grand story is the gospel. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. And that story is going through history. It is going through history. It was here before any of us were here. And it will be here when all of us are gone. Okay? And this is a story that is going through history. It is going through time. And that's important that it can go through time. Not everything can go through time. I know John Lennon of the Beatles one time said, oh, we're more popular than Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, well, I have something to say about John Lennon. 500 years from now, no one will know the name John Lennon, but they will know the name Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you understand me? 
that we are a part of something greater than ourselves. Our little stories, our little narratives, are caught up in this grand narrative, and it's the grand narrative, it's the story of God, God's love manifested in Jesus Christ. Christ died for all. Christ died for all. And so we begin with the small story of Samuel Wesley, who was the father of John Wesley. And Samuel Wesley was born at White Church in 1662, the year in which the Church of England enforced the Act of Uniformity and thereby required the use of the Book of Common Prayer uh, in all her churches. Now, if you know something about English history, uh, the monarchs, uh, they loved to have uniformity, of course, in religion. Uh, and so they issued a decree through Parliament, an act of uniformity, meaning on Sunday mornings, everybody had to be on the same page in an English church. Um, uh, and uh, so they would issue the act of uniformity. And the way of bringing about that act of uniformity was through the Book of Common Prayer. Meaning, if you were in London or Bristol or Manchester, it made no difference. Worship is the same on Sunday morning. Everyone is using the prayer book, okay? That's uniformity. That's an act of uniformity. Now, Samuel, <laughs> Samuel Wesley, who is John Wesley's father, uh, grew up in what we call dissent. In other words, they were not a part of the religious establishment. They were referred to as dissenters, dissenters. They were not a part of the religious establishment, okay? And so, in 1662, when the Act of Uniformity was promulgated, uh, Samuel's father, Samuel Wesley's father, as well as his grandfather, they lost their positions in the church because they were dissenters and they would not accept the Book of Common Prayer. So they lost their jobs. You cannot be in the pulpit anymore, no more, because you must use the Book of Common Prayer. And they said, we cannot. We're Puritans. We uh, dissent from the establishment. And so Samuel's father and his grandfather lost, lost their positions in the church in 1662. So look at the environment that Samuel Wesley is growing up in. He's growing up in a dissenting home. Okay, they're not a part of the religious establishment. This is Samuel Wesley's environment as he's growing up as a young boy. Okay, and so growing up in a dissenting home, uh, Samuel was, by all reports, he was devout and, and serious, and he was very interested in religion. He was very interested in religion, and so when he was a teenager, he was a teenager. He was about 15 years old at the time. Uh, he decided that he was going to look at the Church of England, the Book of Common Prayer, then look at his own Puritan heritage, and then weigh it and see, you know, what do I think? Let me look at this issue. Let me look at the Book of Common Prayer the establishment. Let me look at what my ancestors have taught me in terms of our Puritan heritage. And he did that. He did that as a young, as a young boy, a teenager. And when he did that, he decided for the Church of England. <laughs> he thought that the Church of England had the better of the argument. Uh, and so he made his way as a young boy into the Church of England into the establishment, into established uh, religion. 
And so Samuel rejected the Puritan heritage of his family, having considered these matters very carefully. And so in 1683, uh, he, made his way, he made his way to Oxford and enrolled at Exeter College as a servitor. What does that mean, as a servitor? Well, it basically means if someone is, as, is at Oxford as a servitor, they are paying their expenses by the money they are earning by serving the upperclassmen. So they would serve the upperclassmen, receive money, and then they could pay their tuition. So as a servitor meant that you were financially pinched. You didn't have a lot of money, but you could still go to Oxford. This would be a way to do it. This would be a way to do it. It's sort of like a, a working scholarship. You serve the upper students, you get money, you pay your tuition, you can go to Oxford. Okay? This was his... This was his um, situation, okay? Now, as a young man, Samuel had the good fortune, he had the good fortune uh, to meet Susanna Annesley. Susanna Annesley in 1682, perhaps for the first time at the wedding of Susanna's sister to John Dunton, uh, the noted bookseller. And there are lots of parallels between the life of Samuel and Susanna uh, because Susanna uh, Annesley, Susanna Annesley also grew up in a home of dissent. Uh, in other words, a Puritan heritage. She, her family was not a part of the religious establishment. As a matter of fact, her father was a Noted, noted Puritan leader. Her father was Dr. Samuel Annesley. Dr. Samuel Annesley, he was the principal leader of the nonconformists and he was vicar at St. Giles Cripplegate, okay? Until he was ejected from his pulpit. When was he ejected from his pulpit? Well, the same time as the ones in Samuel Wesley's family, 1662 the year when they promulgated the Act of Uniformity and enforced the Book of Common Prayer uh, throughout all the parishes. Like Samuel, Susanna Wesley thought about Church of England, Puritan heritage. Church of England, Puritan heritage. What shall I do? As a teenager, once again, as a teenager, you know, we have to be, we in the church need to be aware and take young people very, very seriously because some of the decisive changes in life happen at teenage years. And, it, and that's the case for Samuel, that's the case for Susanna. Because Susanna, like Samuel, decides for the Church of England. Even though her father is this great Puritan leader. Uh, Dr. Uh, Samuel Annesley. And so Susanna Annesley, like Samuel Wesley, made her way into the establishment, into the Church of England. And she becomes an Anglican. She becomes uh, a Church of, of England believer. 